Hi guys, and welcome to The Truth Hurts with me, Tony Quinn. The Truth Hurts is a show about recovery and everything in between. And as you can see, I'm actually smiling because I have with me today, Melinda Ferguson, who's come on The Truth Hurts. Hi, Melinda. Hello, darling. Okay, so, <laughs> nice guys, so good to see you. I have actually been nervous the whole day because Melinda, you have been a hero of mine since oh. you, you launched Smack. Um, and Melinda's a, a really well-known author. She owns Melinda Ferguson Books, and she is the author of Smacked, Hooked, Crashed, and a few other books, including it's the Oscar Pistoria stuff, if I'm correct. You yeah, know, you, you've done accident, a, a Oscar and accident waiting to happen, which is yes. a rather good. T- yeah, yeah, and um, so I have been really, really inspired by you my entire life. Like I'm talking. I remember sitting, it was my first job. I was at 44 Stanley and my late cousin bought me a book and it was Smack. And she came in and she gave it to me. It made me emotional. And she was like, and I wasn't even in active addiction at this point. I was drinking heavily and at the height of an eating disorder. And she was like, I saw this book and I just wanted to give it to you. I don't know why, but this is for you. And I promise you, I read that in like two days, just sitting in the shop. I don't think I made one sale. And I related to <laughs> so much in the book and I hadn't even been through addiction, but I had those qualities and I just loved your voice. I loved your honesty. I loved your rawness from the start. And honestly, when I did find myself in the cycle of addiction and going in and out of rehabs, that book was with me at all times. And now wow. I'm sitting here talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's beautiful. I love my stories. I love stories about people who found my book. It's, it makes it all, like I never get tired of hearing that. Okay. I think we're both Leo's though. So we love a bit of, uh, I love it. reinforcement. Yeah, I love reinforcement, but it, you know, it was a hard book to write and it was a very, very exposing book. I mean, yeah. you know that. Yeah. And, and at the time I wrote it, I was really not a very um, successful person. I mean, I was, I was in many ways still really in, in very early recovery. I was about five years clean when it came up, but it felt like I was this tiny little mouse. And I actually thought that if I don't write this book, I might as well kill myself. I mean, it was dark days. And I had a lot of um, like suicidal ideation in my early recovery in in active addiction as well but i mean in early recovery i really thought i was of no use to the planet and that like there would be nothing that i could offer so the book was almost like a it was like a a, 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 a sort of an attempt to try and find a reason to live that's incredible. to make sense yeah that's incredible because also that's just one thing before we get in in early recovery I felt the same and I feel like a lot of people feel that way that it's just not going to get better and it's just it's 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 hard work it's too much hard work consistently and the thing is with someone like you you know it does get better you know and we yeah. see that it's well I mean if anything I think that what happens with us addicts when we come into the rooms or we come into rehab or we come into the kind of first day of, of clean and sober our lives are so fucked and we have fucked up so many things and we've hurt people, we've hurt ourselves. There just doesn't seem to be a possibility that when we look at other people, I remember coming into my first meeting and a guy was sharing a year clean and I just thought, I will never get there. I will never be at 365 days clean. It seemed so big. But it was people, it was people like that who showed that, that you could do that, that made me believe that I could do that. And that's what's beautiful about, I think, recovery is that, is that from the very darkest depths of hopelessness, one little step at a time, one hour, one day at a time, we start finding that actually, maybe it's not that bad and maybe I can brush my hair today. Because that was sometimes like the biggest fucking triumph for me was to brush my hair and um yeah i mean you know that it's like 21 years that i've been doing this that was my perfect segue i was going to be like so you saw someone in in the rooms who had one year and now you're at 21 years it's incredible though 
And you know, a lot, I'm sure you have this as well. Like sometimes when I just sit down and I think about when, it, like what I was, it doesn't seem that long ago. It's like a flash. Yeah. Like me on the streets of Hillbrow, me standing around like a skinny little hooker. <laughs> not like one. Yeah, I was going to yes. say. <laughs> <laughs> like not actually like one, just being one. Um standing in the cold and like fucking begging people for a hit and getting into people's cars and doing things with my dealer and doing all that fucking desperate stuff. Sometimes it doesn't actually feel like that long ago. It, I can see her like me. I can see her. And, and I suppose in a way that's also helped not ever taking this recovery thing for granted. Yes. Like knowing that if I had to just make the, the wrong turn now, I would be back there, but like quickly. And yeah. that's what this is about. I mean, we know how many people die. We know how many people have clean time and then they, they just do one wrong move and they're dead. Yeah. And we've seen so it in lockdown. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot. Hey? It's devastating. But I was yeah. thinking, I mean, you're, you're at 21 years now. You have, you changed the world in a lot of ways you have reached a lot of people like for real i'm just a random girl from freaking santon who found your book and you did you changed my life and i think it's amazing that you have the courage to share your story so honestly and openly without any like you know just raw that's the word and we need that and i would just like um if you're open to it to share a bit of your your story and how you you know, how you got into addiction and where you at now. Basically, your experience, strength, and hope. You know, you're 21 years right. of hope. <laughs> okay, I'll start. And you please interrupt me yeah, and I ask will. me stuff. I really like the idea that we're having a chat. But, you know, I guess when I think about it, I really think I was born with the gene of addiction. You know, I, I, I remember as a child, I was hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I was hungry. I was hungry for, for knowledge, but I was hungry for something that I didn't know what it was. There was like a hole inside me. My dad died when I was very small and I, I always sort of see my life before my father died, I was four years old and then something very destructive and traumatic happened. And that was when I really felt that the world was not okay. Yeah. And I mean, I don't remember, I didn't do, I, I mean, I had my first cigarette when I was four, you know, four, four. Oh it was God. just a storm, I smoked a stompy with the neighbors, you know, they were smoking and I, I picked it up and, and, and it felt right, you know, yeah. something about it felt right. And nine years old, I had my first drink, yes. I found my mother's alcohol, my mum was an alcoholic, which I think is, happens with a lot of us, we have parents who are actually addicts as well, and if we look at our ancestral addiction i'm very interested in kind of ancestral the the, the 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 idea of addicts running through maybe a long line of our heritage oh, yeah, that's i'm sure true. yeah that there were a lot of them all the way up to like ape man yeah. maybe the ape <laughs> so the apes were probably also like having marilla or something <laughs> but anyway shooting up some heroin yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember drinking and thinking this, I'd found heaven. And, and, I, and after the age of nine, I mean, I found ways to get alcohol. By the time I got to high school, I was drinking a lot. Yeah. I was a proper teenage alcoholic. I mean, I adored any opportunity to get drunk. And I wasn't just getting normal drunk like my, my, my classmates. I would get pass out drunk, you know, yeah. like blackout. Yes, yes. I nearly, um, I remember in, in the last year of school, I nearly drowned in the Emerentia Dam uh, on my own puke because I, I, I like literally mixed tequila and gin and, and vodka. And it, there was no like stopping what this thing was calling me to do. Oh, I get that uh, so much. Oh, I can, I can actually see it happening. I can sure. see it. Yeah. And you know, when you're young, it's also fun. It's like, I was one of those kids who was uh, very clever at yeah. school. I was bright. And then, so I had a lot of, I had a lot of cheek. I mean, I got into trouble a lot, but I was always good at my work. And so I could get kind of A's, but then I'd be disruptive. And there was something inside me that was just not at home. Also the eating thing. Yeah. I mean, I got, 
um, I got into bulimia as a, as a teenager. Haven't really spoken a lot about that ever. You know, you except for in SMAP. In, the, in SMAP, right? And now yeah. in SMAP, did you mention marshmallows specifically? Oh, yeah. I had now, the whole marshmallow thing. I did exact. That, that part of the book is the part of the book that got me. When I was sitting in, this, in the shop, I had, I had gone across the road to get my marshmallows. And I'm reading you did the same thing. I could, I, that's the part of the book. The marshmallow thing was weird because it was like very child. And marshmallows are like sweet and gooey. And I always think like with bulimia, you almost are wanting to return to some kind of child place, child space. And then, of course, if you puke marshmallows, they don't sink in you a to toilet. Freaking take that you out. Have to actually get them. Out. <laughs> this is so disgusting. But like you have to fish them out. I know. And you've got to get rid of them. Toilet paper so, bag. <laughs> Toilet paper bag. I mean, a lot of my high school, um, when I say career, a lot of my high school years, my teenage years at home, were spent with my head in the toilet. Um, sure. And, and you know, of all the addictions, I feel is food is like the most devastating one. Like I've been a heroin crack addict. I've been an alcoholic. I've been a dope addict. I've been an everything addict. Food was the one that freaked me out the most. The, 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 the whole act, the secrecy, the, the, the availability of food. Yeah. Everywhere. You need food to live. You don't need heroin to live. You need food to survive. So what is, if you're a food addict, what is the, the line that you draw when you've had enough? There is, like, there's such a... I said it's to such someone... A, it's like with me, yeah. people are like, okay, you've been through addiction and you've had the anorexia and the bulimia or whatever, which I think most people in recovery have, you know, a lot of women have struggled with that. Um, everyone's, I'm like, no, it's, it's recovery from an eating disorder is so much more difficult than addiction because if you like, and this is how I describe it, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but it's like saying to a heroin addict or to a meth addict, you can only have, you can only have, uh, you can only shoot up three times a day with heroin. And that's with food. You have to eat. You have to have it. And it would literally be like someone saying, okay, Tony, you um, give up crystal meth, but have it three times a day. And that's how I see it's it in exactly relation to that. food. Yeah. And you can't have full abstention from food because you're going to then, you know, and then the anorexia thing, you know, I first got anorexic and then to keep my anorexia, anorexic body, yeah. I, I became polemic because I couldn't carry on starving myself on like popcorn and two pieces of pineapple <laughs> for and every day. <laughs> yeah, marshmallows. Yeah. And then the thing, um, like the hunger just increases with eat with food. I mean, the, you know, you know this, Tony. I mean, the, you never have enough. And, yeah. and I, I, I went to university deeply bulimic and I was away from home. I was smoking a lot of dope. I was, I was, it's funny. I've never really spoken in public about this. I've written about my, in my book. So you've managed to get me to talk about the eating thing. And I mean, I remember being so depressed because after purging, one has, one, one really gets a dark feeling. Your, 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 uh, your, your levels of everything are thrown out. And, mm -hmm. and those days in Cape Town when I just lie in my bed and just feel like, and dying and you have to and lie then, down after yeah you have to you're weak mm. you know and it's very traumatic on your body and 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 also the shame i mean the shame there's something quite glamorous about being a heroin or cro coke or a fucking you know whatever addict but to be a vomiting food addict is so shameful Oof. like no one wants to hear a, a person vomiting and you know, also, I remember feeling so guilty because we were in South I mean, we in South Africa knowing there were people that were starving, taking food that could have been there for people to actually live on and then just like doing this puking fucking cycle. I thought about I that often, so much. Yeah. yeah. No, I often cool. think that we become drag addicts to actually keep our bodies in control. You know, in many ways, I think after I managed to kind of put the food down, it wasn't that much long after that I started taking crack and heroin. Yeah. And, you know, you don't feel like eating when you've just had a, had a, a big hit of smack or you've had crack or whatever. So there's a, there's a very 
I think for women, especially in recovery, there's a very complicated relationship with food and the drugs that we take. Absolutely. Because you put, yeah. so for me, I always had the eating disorder. I found my drug of choice. It eased the eating disorder, eased the anorexia, that thinking, because I knew it was under control based on the yeah. drug use. Put the drugs down and then the, the, the eating disorder thinking comes back. And that's the biggest battle. You know, I, I landed up in many ways in, in, in like once I'd got clean, I became like a manic exerciser. And it's only in lockdown that I've kind of calmed down a bit on that. But like Bikram yoga five times a week, you know, all, and this relentlessness of trying to keep control over this, of the outside, which, <laughs> yeah, it's like a whole nother story to tell, you know. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to my drugs. I mean, I yes. got into to, to heroin and food. Food kind of took a, a little bit of a <laughs> another turn there, but it's really interesting, and I'm glad we got to speak about that. Thank you for speaking um, about that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hard stuff, and you make me feel braver because I know how brave you are about this, oh, and I'm yeah, much less brave. But no, I'm much less brave about that part of my my addiction, and so I felt. I feel comfortable talking to you about it. But once I started, um, once I tasted heroin and once I got into chasing heroin and crack between the two of each, I, I was gone. I mean, yeah. that was it. All I had to do in terms of the little girl who still smoked her first little fucking cigarette and who got her first drink at nine, all I had to do was meet the, the, devil, the devil drugs for me were heroin and crack. And I was like finished. I mean, there was nothing inside me that wanted to stop. Once I met those, those two drugs, it was as though my life, and it had been actually semi-manageable. I'd, I'd started becoming a filmmaker. I'd been an actress. We were very good filmmakers. My boyfriend and I, we won awards, and we were kind of like potentially going to go somewhere we met heroin and crack together. And from that moment on, everything descended. On the outside, we managed to have a sem semblance of, of manageability. We still worked, but it was all about where could we get the stuff when we were, you know, and it became from being once every two or three days to every day, every hour, all consuming everything about our lives became about getting a fucking hit. Yeah. And, um, I felt pregnant in uh, 19, at the end of 1995. And I thought that was going to stop me. Yeah. You know, I, when, I, when I saw my pregnancy test, I thought, right, thank God. Like you've got something to actually do, to stop for. But the, the bigger voice inside me went, have another hit. You can't be a mother. This is fucked. You don't want to stop using. And so I carried on using. That's something I've heard a lot of women speak about, like in recovery, is that they fall pregnant, they think that's it, I'm done, I'm done, and it's just, it's too much. That pull to go back is just right. too much. Uh, whenever I do talks or whatever for people who aren't addicts, you know, when we're talking to the normals, I try and explain to them that even pregnancy is not big enough. The voice inside you, the addiction voice is bigger than everything. It's bigger than a life force. It's bigger. It, it takes over everything. And so on my, in my first pregnancy, I landed up going to rehab when I was about two and a half months, I think, pregnant. And I thought, okay, as long as I can be in rehab, I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Stayed in there for quite long and literally stayed clean for three hours when I got out and I was using again. So in my last month of pregnancy, I was right back into, I mean, you can imagine having a big fat stomach. Yeah. I was a skinny little pregnant girl because I'd been such a junkie. So I, I had like a very sort of skinny body with this like, no, which I was quite happy about because I hadn't become like an <laughs> elephant. Um, and then I had this little b ball inside, you know, there, but there I was sitting chasing the dragon and fucking uh -huh. hitting. I was pretty... Yes, so so I, I'd kind of stopped crack, I think, during that time. I, mean, I can't even remember anymore, but it was mainly heroin right at the end. Before, you know, when I felt, when I, when I gave birth, I, in the book, you, that my, my, pre, my, my birth scene is probably one of the most revolting, darkest scenes ever known to literature because there's a woman 
having a baby and trying to chase the dragon in the corridor, you know, because I just couldn't bear it. So. And I was terrified of becoming a mum. I mean, I knew I wasn't ready. You know, I was 29, but I still, I mean, I was like a child. I was like 10, you know, and, and, and when I gave birth to James, I was convinced that I'd destroyed him. I was convinced that I, he was retarded. I was convinced he was deformed. I gave birth to a perfect baby, but I couldn't even see it. You know, I looked at him and I was so ashamed. I, I actually couldn't even look at my own baby. And all I wanted to do was use, 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 get high, get out of it, forget everything, just get out of it. Um, my boyfriend who had become my husband was actually, thank fuck, a much better mother than I was. And um, he was an addict as well, but he seemed to be able to, 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 to look after our son while I was all the time going, when are we going to get more? When are we going to get more? I was like that real fucking crazy woman. Yeah. Um, so we got, so uh, we, we, uh, we did, I did a fraud on someone. That was kind of what, what, what was a type of a, a catalyst for me to, to be shipped out of Joburg and go and stay in Clarkstall where um, my husband's family was. And we sat there in Clarkstall of all places trying to fucking <laughs> stay get clean. And it's so depressing. And I think we stayed clean for about six months trying to become parents to our beautiful child who was absolutely beautiful. Um, but I still, I couldn't see it. You know, mm -hmm. I only saw it late. I missed so much because I just couldn't see it. Um, and then we relapsed and then it all started again, yeah. driving to and from Clarkstalk every day, fucking with tinfoil, you know, stealing money from his mom, stealing money, pawning lawnmowers, doing whatever we could. And then I felt pregnant again. Can you believe it? <laughs> Jesus. I mean, that was, my second pregnancy was so depressing. I, I, my son recently, my youngest son, Daniel, recently read my book. Oh, it was about wow, two, yeah. Two years ago. And, you know, in my book, I, I keep talking about wanting to have an abortion while I've got him in my stomach. And he was so upset by that. It was a hardcore thing that my son read my book. But, you know, I said to him, I, I said, the reason you need to read this book and I'm glad you have because he did it without me knowing. And then he came to me and he, and he accused me of all sorts of terrible things, which were all true. Yeah. That's wow. Yeah. And I said to him, you know what, there are things inside you that you don't understand and you need to understand that it's not you. It's me. It's what happened with me that, that has created whatever you have in you. And it, it really made a big difference. Hey, he, he understood a lot of his own feelings of rejection because while he was in utero, I was sitting planning my suicide. I mean, I literally planned and tried to kill myself about five times while I was pregnant with him. I think it's so, amazing so we, he's read it. Unbelievable. He's, not, he's so bright. He's so brilliant. And he's really been able to process it. It was <laughs> almost like this fucked up gift that I gave him. You know, yeah. sometimes the truth is the biggest gift. And that's what I felt with my book. And even giving my sons this book, it, 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 you know, neither of them use, both of them are amazing. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't use. They are 22 and 23 years old and they fucking are the cleanest two 20 something year old. <laughs> because I've done it for them. Yep. And you know, because I know, I never lied about it. I never tried to pretend that I wasn't what I was. And their dad as well. That's beautiful. So, oh. long story short, yes. I mean, I, I, I land up having a second child in addiction again, which is just like, how the fuck could I have let that happen? Um, and quite soon after Dan was born, he was about six months, everything, you know, everything just came to an, a, a complete, like, crisis point. My mother-in-law took my sons from me, my babies, told me to get fucked, put her son in rehab, and I got onto the streets. And that's, you know, smacked opens with uh, me getting gang raped. And so on the streets, it just became so hectic. I, I'd lost all sense of protection for myself. It was just now balls to the walls, smoke until you die, kill yourself, find a way to die. It was just like more, more, more. Like the monster had really, monster came really alive in Hillbrow. 
And I did things that I never in my wildest fucking nightmares thought I would do. That, that opening scene in the book, like as you, as you mentioned now, it's almost like I can actually see the writing and what I was imagining. No, wow. Yeah. I, it, I it mean, it's, my mind. Right, yeah. it's so crazy because like there's so many women who are raped in this country and there's so many women who, have, who go through that journey. And I have a bit of a disassociation from what happened. And I think that that I kind of had to do that because even while it was happening, yeah. my mind, my body and I think it's never quite returned to be honest it stayed it, it I think we sometimes have to do that to protect our our, our, our minds yeah uh, when one goes through enormous trauma and, and and I found it almost like people say was it therapeutic to write about it I, no I didn't think it was therapeutic it felt like I was just standing outside of myself and recording something it feels like you're looking back on a movie. Yeah. Like, it's almost like, I know this happened. I know that it happened to this person, but it's not that yeah. connection that it's me, that that's it's you, me. you know, I get that. Yeah. I get that. Oh. Yeah. And even, I mean, Tony, despite everything happening, my kids had been taken away. I was now walking around Hillbrow in a little fucking mini and fishnet stockings, trying to get into people's cars and sleeping with dealers and doing all these things to get, to get crack. More than anything, I wanted crack at that point. Um, there was, well, there was nothing inside me that said you need to stop. Like, I think that's the one thing people don't understand about addicts. We don't have this voice of reason that says it's enough now. Like if we had that voice, we wouldn't use. You wouldn't have gotten to that point. I wouldn't have gotten yeah. to that point. So there was no voice inside me saying, you've done, you know, your children have gone, you, you've, you've been raped now. You, all, I, all I kept thinking was, more, 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 more. And it just became like a more, 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 more. And um, the more I took, the more I wanted. And the more I took, the more I kind of forgot. And, and, and so at the end, it felt like I just completely left this other life. And I was like, almost happy. <laughs> like, I can say that I was almost happy with all these new friends, the hookers and the dealers. And I felt like at home for the first time in many years, I felt like I'd found a home and that they didn't judge me. <laughs> I get because that. My ad, yeah, yeah. My ad wanted to be given full permission to do what I needed to do. Yeah. And I think it was like a death urge, really. It was like a death urge had taken me and I was now just ready to go. And then I got kind of rescued by my family and, and I really didn't want to go, you know. I mean, if I think about it, the way that I felt they were almost my enemies came to take me away from, my, from, my, from the love of my life, which was crap. Yeah. Um, but I do think that it was you know, higher power stuff when I think about it, because if they hadn't have intervened, I don't think I would be sitting talking to you. I do not think I had it in me to leave. Uh, honestly, yeah, Mel, you had gone into... Uh, yeah, I just, I'd gone to the beyond. Yeah. The fact I mean, that you I got out of it... Yeah, I often wonder, like, you know, I mean, it's stupid to wonder, would I have gotten out myself? You know, I'd, it's almost pointless to wonder that. So I was taken out and I was thrown onto some godforsaken Holly, uh, Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood, homeless, not a Hollywood farm. No, there was no Hollywood farm. For no me. Hollywood just, yet. <laughs> just homeless, homeless farm, lots of tramps, lots of beggars, me sort of freaking out, not really knowing why I was there, not wanting to be there. Um, and I mean, it's probably the book, the part of the book that I actually enjoy reading. Sometimes I read it again because it was so absurd of me landing up with all these people and me thinking I was somebody, but I was actually nobody. Yeah. And I was so arrogant and I was so fucked. And, um, I mean, I got, I, I, I didn't get clean immediately. I tried to find Dhaka. I tried to find alcohol. I did whatever I could to get something. And then I was bust for smoking a joint and I was chucked off the homeless farm. And I always go, if you're chucked off a homeless yeah, farm, gonna... there's nowhere. Else. Yeah. It's like, it's over. And that was something that said to me, mm. you're fucked. You're like, you actually are fucked, Melinda. Like there was a voice of 
something started connecting saying, you've got nowhere else to go. You go and stand at the robots now. No one will take you back. My family had had enough. Um, you either have to get on your hands and knees and beg to stay, which is what I did. I mean, I was desperate. I think, des you know, when they say your gift of desperation, well, I got my gift of desperation when I was thrown off a homeless farm. And I remember going on my hands and knees and swearing on my life to the guy who owned the farm that I would, whatever, whatever was needed, I would do and I would never use again. And I swore on my life and he said he was going to test me, which he did. And I stopped using on the 1st of September, 1999. Out of the absolute, like there was no other way left. It was over. Wow. Oh God. And then Tony, the whole, like, as we were saying at the beginning of the, of this talk, um, I was going to say, I'll show. <laughs> I'll of, show. I'll show. I wish. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that would be cool. Because me and Mel are going to start a show together. <laughs> no, I'd love it. So imagine doing this together. I'd love it. We'd have the best. Um, so, so it was what we speak. What we spoke about at the beginning of the, of our talk was about how hard it is in the beginning. And I want to get to that because when I got into the rooms and when I got into recovery, ah, it was hard. I had nothing. And when I say nothing. I had no ID book. I had no wallet. I had no money. I had none of my own clothes. I, I had no children. I had no husband. I had no home. And I had to sit and li literally rely on the kindness of strangers and of people at the meetings to pick me up. My mom allowed me to stay at the house, but it was very hard because she was drinking and she was not stopping. And I literally spent that first year going to meetings really using the rooms of, of Narcotics Anonymous as the only highlights of my day. When I couldn't car. work. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was very sad, hey? and I nearly feel like crying as well. I was so lost. I had no, I had nothing left. It was like my brain had been raped. Yeah. My brain, literally my body had been raped and my brain had even been raped more. And just getting up out of bed to kind of put the kettle on or to comb my hair or to do anything was a big effort. And that is why it is such a fucking miracle because today I'm like this Duracell bunny <laughs> and I've got so much energy that I don't even know what to do with it. I mean, from that girl who couldn't get out of bed, 11 o'clock would come and I'd hear the clock ticking and I'd think, oh God, I'm going to get out of bed. What am I going to do? I've got nothing to do in the day. I had nothing. You know, I'd look at street sweepers and they looked like at least they had something to do. When you don't have work and you feel useless, it is a very, very, very hard place to sit and think that there's a reason to be alive. Yeah. Yeah. And I just... I, I did a lot of service in my first year. I mean, I literally, that, I didn't work. I just, I would kind of put the chairs out and I'd drink a cup of, like, I'd drink the coffee and then, like, clean the cups. And I felt like such an imposter. At I see, that's, that's the thing. I just want to touch on it so people know. So Narcotics Anonymous for me is, is, was a lifesaver. I'm not, I'm not a yeah. part of it anymore. Like, I'll go, I'll go to a meeting once in a while, you know. But that first, mm. those first few years, I was there religiously every single night, like you're saying. And service is when you actually play a part within the Narcotics Anonymous community. And that's where, when Mel's like moving the chairs, serving the coffee. I mean, it does. It gives you purpose. And that's what it I love you, about NA. Yeah. Because the thing is, I think when, you're in, when you come out of your, your active addiction, we all have a, an absolute sense of, of, of like the distraction that we've left behind us. And we've never done anything nice except for steal, lie, cheat, take hurt and so to start like going oh, i'm gonna clean a cup <laughs> i'm gonna put a chair out for someone it's like such a big spiritual it's like a big spiritual act yeah and not not as as in an act but as a gesture that changes the taking to the giving yes and i, oh, I love that that yeah i think that's what what, what really narcotics anonymous taught me from like the very basics was that 
that idea of you can only keep what you have by giving it away. I love that, that line so much. You can only keep what you have by giving it away. And I really understood that as a way to say, you can only keep what you're, you have in terms of staying clean by helping other people who are also trying. And then a beautiful thing starts happening. And, and, and so where I've never believed that I could be of any use to anybody, it started slowly dawning on me that I could actually, I could maybe be of use to people. And then the whole thing of someone asks you to be a sponsor, you know, like, oh, me, like, what do I know? And like, you start sponsoring someone. And so this like beautiful thing starts happening. Um, and that's what, you know, I mean, for the first few years of, of, of recovery in, in, in terms of my, my manageability in the real world, it was, it was very low, but, but it felt like as a little spirit, I was growing and I was really, really doing the hard work. You know, I was doing the written work. I was doing all the soul searching. I was trying to say sorry to people. I really got humble. And I do think that if we don't get humble, as recovering addicts, we don't have a good chance of staying clean Absolutely. because our egos mm. are always going to tell us that we need, we know more, fuck everybody, blame, 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 you hurt me and, 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 and accumulate reasons for using again, because that's yeah. what the ego does. It tells you that you're right and everybody else is wrong. And, so and, and I think that the, the I had to have really the shit kicked out of me to be actually told you are a fucking piece of shit <laughs> who's lying on a homeless farm before the message came to me that maybe I had a problem. Maybe, <laughs> just maybe. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> maybe I have a little bit of an issue that might need some addressing. And it took me so long to get the message that I was actually fucked. Yeah. I mean, the... the the evidence was so clear to everybody else, but to me, I was the last person to realize that I actually had a problem. Oh, it's amazing how that works. It's amazing. <laughs> you're and like selling yourself on the street and you're like, no, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. In control. I, was a, I was a prefect at school. <laughs> and you're telling all these hookers, you know, I'm somebody. And they're all going, yeah, right. You know, like fucking nobody. But, but, but it's amazing what shit we sell ourselves when we're in addiction. And, and it's amazing what the, the truth and the clarity of truth does in terms of liberating us. And I really did feel like that miracle that happened when I, the need to use was lifted. Mm -hmm. It miraculously was lifted when I surrendered. And it's amazing. I mean, like that is it. It's, you cannot you cannot teach people to surrender. It's a it's an internal thing that happens where you actually finally give up and you let go, and you go, I can't anymore. And there's such a beautiful feeling of relief when we finally say it's over. It's I don't have to do this again. And it's like. Yeah. For me, that moment, like in, in every aspect and talking, you know, with addiction and with the eating stuff, that moment didn't happen like this big spiritual awakening where it was like, I've surrendered, I've, this happened and I'm done. It just slowly happens. And one day you wake up and you're like, I can do I don't want to use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't need to use again. Yeah. I mean, there's like such a, it's almost like, what? <laughs> yeah. Did that just happen? Like, because it's so foreign to not want to use. Yeah. Um, but that, that really, and, and, and I often say to people who kind of serially, serially relapse, I often just say, you haven't really actually done that step one. You haven't, you don't really believe that you've really got a problem. Yeah. Because if you really do believe that you have, you will be, it will be lifted. If one really, and it's not about writing 500 exercise books, because you know, these, like this step one is one thing, but it's actually such a, it's such a simple thought. And it, it literally can change your life in an instant to actually go, my life has become so unmanageable that I know 
that I can no longer use. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like maths. Yeah. I always feel like recovery is a bit like maths, where you go one plus one equals two, and yeah. fucking just believe it. It's the only math okay? I'm good at. <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> only math I've it's got in this point. <laughs> yeah. Because it's logic. Yeah. It's logic. It's like if you can actually allow yourself to just for a second be logical and say, if my life has become so fucking unmanageable, what do I think I'm going to actually get more out of if I keep doing what I'm doing? And that whole definition of insanity is about doing the same thing and expecting different results. Yeah. Um, that, that I think it's when it dawns on one, it's such a beautiful, it's literally where peace comes. And so one doesn't have money, one can't like, one doesn't have jobs, you don't have good relationships anymore. But what you've got is clarity. Yeah. And I always say to people like, just trust that your life is not going to get worse if you stop using. Because I've never seen one addict who stayed clean, his life got worse. It got better. It, it can't, it's maths. It, it's maths. It can't get worse. If you don't do this, do this, do this, use all your money, fuck your wife over, fuck your husband or your friends or your boyfriend, turn on your children, abandon people. If you don't do all of that and all you do is sit still, you're still doing better <laughs> than you would have done if you were doing all of that. Even if you do fuck all in your recovery, you're still doing better than if you did that. So it's, it's, and slowly the doing of fuck all becomes the doing of something because you can't sit and do fuck all being clean for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, that's just going to be like, <laughs> so it's going to be like fucking boring to sit and be clean and just sit there. So slowly, you know, I mean, my first job was as a fucking waitress. And, and I mean, I got like distinctions in my trick. I'm really bright. I mean, it humiliated me to go and say, can I get a job in a, in a fishmonger? But I had to do that. I had to say, do something. I always say to addicts, do anything, man. Fucking clean shit off the ground. Do something. You have to. You have to. Because all of the things that we do, they have a repercussion and some another door opens. Mm -hmm. Like that Bob Marley song. You know, like one door, uh, uh, when a door uh, opens something else, uh, I don't know what he's fucking lying. One door now. closes the other. Yeah, that, that, another yeah, one opens. It's another yeah. one opens. And, you know, it was in the restaurant where I met the editor of a mag or deputy editor of a magazine who gave me my first job at the magazine where my first article that I ever wrote was found in a magazine four years later by a publisher who then phoned me, found me and got me to write my book. So if I hadn't have been the waitress who went to serve the, ed the editor who asked me to write something, if I hadn't have written something and didn't get published and blah, 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 blah everything started making sense. And, and for me, what recovery has really been is like looking back at my 21 years, every single thing that happened from the moment I put it all down on the 1st of September, 1999 and said, it's over. Every single thing has been linked to something else. And I really believe Tony that our true purpose as human beings it's opened up to us when we get clean. Like we land up being able to shift yes. into the, the purpose of our lives is to love ourselves and to love other people. I really believe that is our true purpose. There's nothing more complicated that we love ourselves um, and then we can love other people. But if we, we have to start with a journey of self-love because if we don't do that, we can never, ever, ever love other people. It's so true. And it is. Yeah, it's like a revolution, you know. I mean, I always say to people, fuck, stop trying to have a revolution outside. Have it inside. The revolution of self-love, of, 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 of making amends to the spirit of one's own self, which then has this magical way of opening up towards everything else. And that's what recovery is. It, you know, it, it is about the 12 steps and all that, but it's not even. Yeah. The That's 12 steps are you there. Yeah. And they are a wonderful way of, of getting kind of the blueprint on yeah. how to live a life. But in the end, if you do not find a way to a journey back to love of the self, the steps can just become like these meaningless things. 
And to, to find a way to, to love oneself, one has to start doing things that you're proud of. Oh, and that, you, that. Where you honor, yeah, where you honor yourself and that you honor the spirit that you've been given and for all the things we do wrong that we forgive ourselves and that even if other people don't forgive us, it doesn't actually matter. We need, we have to forgive ourselves and then we are able to, to, to start creating and doing the things that we should. I think that that's the best way to put it. You know, I found with this channel in some way it was me. I mean, I've, I've spoken recently about some, you know, some really dark stuff to do with the eating disorder that I still, it makes it like for years has kind of eaten away at me. And I, I'm now owning it more than ever before and just saying it like it is. And every time I do that, it's like this huge weight, um, weight is really genuinely just lifted. And I'm just finding myself more and more every day. I'm finding me more and more every day. Oh. You know, I must tell you, I mean, it was only, I think, you know, it didn't just happen, this thing. It was only like in my 14th year, I think, of recovery when I had the car accident. And fuck. We are trashed yeah. the Ferrari, which is what happened. Um, that's when I really realized how fucked I actually still was, you know? And I think that it's a constant. There are times that I might, at 23 years clean, have my worst year ever in recovery. I think that somewhere along the line, we believe that as addicts that we owed a, an easy life once we get clean. Yeah. Like, what's going to happen? Nothing can happen. And then we get hit with shit. And a lot of people use again when the first disaster happens, your mother dies or someone dies mm -hmm. or, or something happens, you lose your job. These are things that happen in life. They're never not going to happen to us just because we're in recovery. Exactly. And I think, yeah. And I think that, that was something that I, I took a long time to realize that just because I got clean didn't mean I was going to get an easy life. You know, that life was still going to be hard. But it w what was I going to do with that life? And how was I going to, how was I going to, how was I going to get through a day without using? Because there were days like when my mom died of cancer, I really wanted to drink again. Yeah. And, and, and even in COVID this year, I had some very dark days where I thought, fuck man, if we're going to all die of some virus, I might as well get some heroin. It's Honestly, I think <laughs> I thought that, and I mean, I caught myself. I didn't go and score, but geez, I got a fright. I was like, you're 20 years clean. What are you fucking doing this talk for? But there was a very dark feeling at the beginning of lockdown where it felt like we were, it, we were being thrown into, a, into a, a, a total tunnel where we didn't know what the end was going to be. Yeah. And my addict decided to come back during this time and say to me, ah, you know what, Melinda, you don't want to die not having fucking smoked a bit of smack again <laughs> in that lovely voice. You know how sexy that addict can be. And Hello, you just go, <laughs> yeah. Smoke some crap. I got a fright. I started doing a lot of online meetings in lockdown. Um, I've been doing a lot of online meetings, amazingly. I've, I've used the, the whole NA online vibe, the world meetings. I've, I've really got a lot out of the days when I was very, very broken and, and, mm. and scared. I used, I used NA again, you know? I think that's such an important thing that people need to, need to acknowledge is that, yes, in a, the world doesn't owe you anything as a recovering addict. It doesn't mm. owe you anything. It's not going to make your life. It's not going to give you some easy ride. And you are going to have some really, 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 really tough and testing times in recovery. And it's okay to say, I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm struggling. Yeah. And to get the help and to ask for the help and bring yourself back. And I feel like a lot of people ignore that and think that their recovery needs to be perfect and smooth and they oh. need to keep it up. And that's not how it works. I mean, I think that's one of the, you know, and I'm not blaming NA and Narcotics Anonymous for that, but there is a bit of a sense of like, you know, all the key rings that one gets and all this affirmation mm -hmm. that, that kind of the longer clean time you have, the less you're allowed to actually admit that you're fucking falling apart. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I, I never allowed myself to get pulled into. And I think that's what has given me 21 years is because when I've needed help, I've fucking gone down on my hands and knees and I've told people I'm not fucking coping. And I haven't had like that horrible sick pride 
to say, oh, I better, you know, I better, I better not show them that I'm not actually the person that I'm pretending that I am. Mm. So I think it's all about like, as long as one is staying authentic and one is being real and one is saying, I'm not coping, like I feel like smoking or whatever you have to do in order to bust that fucking addict. Those are the people I think who I have got a much better chance of kind of staying clean than if one is trying to like be something that you're not. It's all about being like real, I think. And I think that's that's the the most important message for me. That's I just think it's about being authentic, owning your shit, and speaking your truth about everything, about addiction, about recovery, and what's what's real to you. And that's what you do. Well, I try to. I mean, I've had times in my recovery where I did. I did want to be appearing better than what I was. Yeah. And that was when I had a car crash, you know? I mean, it's, it's amazing how life gives you what you need. When you are like acting out of your, acting beyond, like not within your integrity or that you are going on to, like I was very materialistic just before I crashed that car and I was really losing the spirits of things. I wasn't on a journey of self-love. I was on a journey of accumulation. And I think that's very difficult for us people because once we start becoming more successful, it's very seductive. And I still do this. You know, it's not like I haven't stopped. I find it very seductive to, to try and prosper in this yeah. world that I wasn't successful in. But if one does, if one loses the, 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 the sense of that none of this stuff actually means anything, if one, if, one, if one doesn't stay in the real of what that all of this stuff is just really another fix. Because there are hundreds of fixes that we as human beings, never mind if, whether we, if we're addicts or not, and that we are lured into. Materialism, consumerism, social media, fucking sex, um, everything about food, everything about our society is about more. Yeah. Even if you're not a fucking addict, you're being told that if you don't have this, you're nothing. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you're nothing. And if you have this, you're something. And if you buy this, you'll be something else. So it, we get a lot of seduction in terms of what the whole consumerist thing. I know you love Fight Club. Yeah. And <laughs> I love Fight Club as well, you know. And, 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 and there's so many beautiful quotes from that movie about, like, the things we own end up owning mm -hmm. us. Yeah. Yeah. Chuck Palahniuk's my boy, man. <laughs> yeah, fact, fact. I got two signed so books. Have you? I do. My friend was in Washington, and she got two signed copies for me: "Invisible awesome. Monsters" and "Fight Club." <laughs> oh my God! I want to take a photograph. I I, I screamed when she brought them back. I screamed. Oh <laughs> my God! That is beautiful. I'll send you. I'll send you a picture. <laughs> I mean, listen, I could talk for hours about this stuff. I yeah. mean, I, you know, I, I don't even know where I landed up in my journey. It doesn't really matter. I mean, the fact is that I know that if I can get clean, anyone can. I know that if I can get into recovery, anybody can. I know that if, like, I can make a life, anybody can. Um, I do think one has to work hard. I think one has to actually be focused and one just has to give yourself a chance. Like I gave myself a fucking chance. That's nice. Yeah. Give yourself a chance. Give That's yourself it. a chance. Like just see what happens if you actually decide, wow, maybe I should try and live. Yeah. It might be interesting, you yeah. know, instead of trying to destroy myself, let me see what happens if I actually try and nurture myself. And try and actually be kind to myself and not hurt myself. And if I don't hurt myself, I will not hurt other people. And that's the thing. Yeah. And that's it. If that's try, recovery. Yeah. It's so simple. It's yeah. like just be kind to yourself and you will then be kind to other people. Animals, the planet, people, the whole thing relies on us trying to be kind to ourselves and i like what you said it's just basic math that's it it's basic math it is i love that <laughs> that's going to be the catchphrase of yeah. this episode yeah. <laughs> basic math yeah recovery is math yeah. yeah one plus one 
equals two. And if you get one hour, you can get another hour, and then you got two hours. And then you get 21 and years. And other stuff, you know. <laughs> and then suddenly you look up and you got 21 years and your hair is going a bit gray. But you're going, well, fuck, I feel better than I've ever in my life. I honestly feel better than I've ever in my life. And and the years that we now, as as we get older or whatever, I mean, for me, that doesn't really even make sense anymore. Because I keep telling myself I'm only 21. I've just had my... <laughs> 21st birthday <laughs> <laughs> guys i'm only eight and that's how it feels because new life we're given a new chance you know that's incredible yeah she's only eight i'm 21 i'm like the biggest sister god you eight i'm oh, eight you look so cute little 18 eight. until eight years old <laughs> quite developed but i'm eight yeah, <laughs> yeah no like a little overdeveloped a little bit yeah a little bit I am so beyond like, okay. I was so nervous for you coming on the show that are you, I think you're stuck. Oh no, you're moving there. Um, that, okay. So I've met a lot of like really well-known people. I know you, you're not good. And I met Lenny Kravitz once and I couldn't even speak to him. I went like this. I gave him something to sign and I put it away and I just walked away. Like it, that's how I felt. That's how I felt speaking to you. That's how nervous I was speaking. Oh, to you. come on. <laughs> and like Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, really? I'm just, I'm so honored to have you share your voice with us and share your story and your, your experience, your strength and your hope. And the fact that you shared it with the world is just so inspiring to me. And it's, you're an amazing, amazing woman, and I'm not just saying that. Like, if anyone has read your books, they'll know. They'll know just how incredible you are. And in a way, without you knowing you, you played a part in saving my life. And you've done that for a lot of people. I can tell you that much. So thank Aww. you. I love that. <laughs> I don't even know that, but I love that. If I've helped in any way, I'm really fucking happy. It feels like then everything is worth it. Like all the suffering and all the, man the craziness and all the insanity, if, if it has helped anybody, it's worth it. And it has. And you, and I'm, so, I'm so in awe of you. I think you're doing amazing work with your, or with your YouTube stuff and the way that you are like getting addiction out there, getting hard, hard topics out there into the into the public consciousness. I think it's so important. And I just think you're amazing. And I, I really love you, Tony. I love you so much, Mel. I genuinely do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to wrap the episode up now, but I'm gonna speak to you afterwards and say goodbye because you are the best person in the whole world. And I can't believe I just spoke to you on this channel. <laughs> okay, Guys. Wow, well, I've been waiting. I've been, I was too scared to ask you. I was so scared to ask you. <laughs> Why doesn't she ask me? I was so nervous. And then one day I was like, I'm going to do it. And you know, like when you're messaging someone, like you have a crush on and you're like, I'm going to send the message guys. And then I sent it and then you responded. And I was like, Ooh. <laughs> anyway, Mel, thank you so much for being on the show. We must do it again as well. We can like come up with some topics and discuss it and some of the other stuff you're doing as well. And yeah, wow. it's an honor to have you guys. Let us know your thoughts. If you have any questions for Mel, Leave them in the comments. Um, and yeah, go get yourself any of her books. Just do yourself a favor, for real. <laughs> Change my life. If you are struggling with anything, get the books. If you know someone who has been struggling with it, get the books. And if you're just interested, get the books. So, Mel, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Okay, guys, um, I'm going to shut this down, but thank you for watching. Like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye. Oh, wait. Record. Stop.